All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. It is Sunday, March 26, 2023. I want to welcome everybody to today's uh, broadcast. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. And today we're going to uh, discuss a topic that I have talked about before, but this deals with uh, myths about slavery that we need to stop believing myths about slavery we need to stop believing so uh we'll discuss this in this history lesson and then also i'll give you information because i'm teaching uh another session of my 12-week online course today um black resistance movements from the haitian revolution u.s civil war civil rights movement and black power movement okay so we're going to start that as soon as i finish this broadcast so i'll give you the information so you can register for that uh class as well Okay, so there's a, a really good article from uh, the Washington Post by uh, two African-American female historians, Dr. Dana Ramey Berry and Dr. Talitha L. LaFloria. And uh, I know both of them. I've had both of them on the African History Network show. Uh, the name of this article is Five Myths About Slavery. Uh, no, the Civil War didn't end slavery, and the first Africans did not arrive in America in 1619. So this article is from February 7th, 2020, from the Washington Post. Okay, it's a really good article uh, by these two sisters. And the uh, Dr. Uh, Talitha LaFloria, um, I've interviewed her on the African History Network show about uh, this book here, Chained in Silence. This is a book she wrote. Chained in Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South. Chained in Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South. All right. So you can check that, check out that article, but uh, check out that book by Dr. Uh, Talitha L. LaFloria. And she also wrote this article, uh, co-wrote this article along with Dr. Dana Ramey Berry. Now, uh, Dr. Dana Ramey Berry has an essay. And, and let me find the book here. Dr. Dana Ramey Berry has an essay in the uh, book uh, that deals with the Nat Turner Rebellion. Okay. Um, and I just I just saw the book here. Hold on in the office. Uh, this deals with the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831. Uh, so th the birth of a nation. OK, this book, The Birth of a Nation, which deals with the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1831. And this is the official movie tie in. OK, the official movie tie in The Birth of a Nation, Nat Turner and the Making of a Movement, edited by Nate Parker. OK, this is the official movie tie in book. And this book has interviews with um, this book has interviews with like cast members uh, Nate Parker, different things like this for, for the movie, The Birth of a Nation, that Nate Parker put out about the Nat Turner Rebellion, right? But it also has a chapter in here on history. Uh, and this chapter on history starts on page 35. It's called The Unbroken Chain of Enslaved African Resistance and Rebellion, written by Dr. Erica Armstrong Dunbar and Dr. Dana Ramey Berry. This, this chapter right here, it starts on page 35. So this chapter is a historical chapter, which gives background information on Nat Turner and the Nat Turner Rebellion. All right. So, um, so these two sisters that I just explained to you, they wrote this article here. So let's look at this. Uh, so number one, the number one myth, uh, well, first off, they, they talk about this um, study from the Southern Poverty Law Center that I've talked about on the African History Network show before, and I use in my uh, online classes. Uh, the name of the study is Teaching Hard History American Slavery, Teaching Hard History American Slavery. And the article starts out and says, only 8% of high school seniors can identify slavery as a central cause of the US Civil War. Only 8% of high school seniors can identify slavery as a central cause of the U.S. Civil War, according to a recent Southern Poverty Law Center uh, survey. Okay, and this auto, this survey came out. I think it was twenty, 
2018 that this study came out. The average American has grown up believing a slew of myths about the institution, the institution of slavery. As scholars, as scholars of slavery and its aftermath, we've identified a few of the many misconceptions we have encountered in the classroom and in public spaces and in public spaces over the years. All right. And the reason why this type of information is so important is you've heard me say before, America must have a massive history lesson. America must have a massive history lesson because Americans are very ignorant of history. And when it comes to trying to get our needs met at the government level based upon laws and policies, because it was laws and policies that created the structural inequities and maldistribute, maldistributed wealth upon resources into the hands largely of Europeans. When it comes to getting those needs met and correcting the uh, damage of a legacy of 246 years of slavery, decades of Jim Crow segregation, redlining, housing discrimination, uh, voter suppression, discrimination when it comes to getting bank loans, uh, education, et cetera, you're dealing with people largely who are ignorant of history. So your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history. Okay. And America must have a massive history lesson. Now, this is the uh, study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, Teaching Hard History, American Slavery, Teaching Hard History, American Slavery. And it's a uh, about a 52 page study that documents how the history of slavery is, is being incorrectly taught in schools across the country. And it, it lays out uh, ways to better teach the history of slavery. OK, and they did a survey of high school seniors all across the country. And they found out how little they knew. It was a, a thousand high school seniors they surveyed and they found out how little they knew about the history of slavery. OK, so the first myth that we need to stop believing is that the first Americans, the first Africans came to America in 1619. Now, we know August 20th, 1619 has been drilled into our heads. We know you have the 1619 project. Uh, and it does, it, they do have some good information in the 1619 project. It is flawed. I've talked about that before here on the African History Network show. Um, and then we know you have the 1619 project on Hulu, things like this. But not a lot is talked about about the African presence before 1619. And that's really problematic because this was our land stolen from us. OK, and the sooner we realize that, the better off we'll be and we'll have a seismic shift in the mindset of uh, of African-Americans. And we have to co uh, correct the historical record. So U.S. history textbooks commonly introduce 1619 as the year Africans arrived in America. This date has appeared in sources such as the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and the Associated Press. And it has become and it has become uh, even more uh, entrenched in the popular imagination, thanks to the New York Times magazine, New York Times magazine's 1619 project commemorating the anniversary of the 20 and odd uh, uh, Negroes who landed at Point Comfort, Virginia, 40, 400 years ago. Point Comfort, Virginia, 400 years ago. This is at Point Comfort, really in Hampton, Virginia, not Jamestown. While this date is indeed significant to uh, British arrival and settlement, Africans came to America well earlier. Africans came to America well earlier. Some such as Juan Garrido and uh, Esteban, also known as the Stavanico, came as explorers with the Spanish in 1503 and 1528, respectively. Because of their mobility and influence among the conquistadors, historians offer differing interpretations on whether they were uh, ever enslaved. But at some point, both men were considered free. Okay, now another example is Isabel uh, de Overa, O-L-V-E-R-A, 
who was a free woman of African descent, who in the year 1600 went on an expedition to New Spain, New Spain, which was a, a region comprising of present day New Mexico, Arizona, Florida, and other parts of North and South America. Okay. A lot of that was under Spanish control. All right. New Spain. Uh, and that's why it's called New Spain. That was all um, uh, Spanish uh, territory. And, and they went in search of trade goods and new places to settle. These stories these stories too are important to us history these stories too are important to us history they place the starting point of african-american history in freedom as well as enslavement okay now if we go a step further uh and and, and let's just deal with this quickly here so juan garrido is probably the first african that we know of uh by name okay juan garrido and Juan Garrido um, came in 1513 with Juan Ponce de Leon, Spanish conquistador. Uh, there's a there's a good article by uh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., who I have a lot of problems with, but he does do good research. Uh, and I, I and you know I, I give him credit on that. I read two of his books, and I've read dozens of articles that he's written. Um, it, this deals with there's an article that he wrote for the root.com years ago that deals with the uh first african american who was the first african american and he talks about juan garrido okay and this was in a series that gates did um some years ago for the root.com called uh, 100 amazing facts about the negro this is back in like 2012 100 amazing facts about the negro and he took each each week he would take a fact uh from j.a rogers book 100 amazing facts about the negro and he would do research on it and, and write a, a, a article about it so who was the first african-american this is from october 22nd 2022 from the root.com um and he talks about uh, Juan Garrido here. Juan Garrido was born in West Africa around 1480, according to the historians Ricardo um, Alegria and Jane Landers. Juan Garrido's notarized pro, uh, probanza, which was his curriculum uh, uh, vita, more or less, dated 1538, says he moved from Africa uh, to Lisbon, Portugal of his own volition as a free man, stayed in Spain for seven years and then seeking his fortune and perhaps a bit of fame, he joined the earliest uh, conquistadors to the new world. All of the sworn witnesses, all of the sworn witnesses to this document affirm that Juan Garrido was Horro, H-O-R-R-O, or free when he arrived in Spain. Sailing from Seville, uh, Spain around 1508, um, he uh, arrived on the island of uh, La uh, La Española, which is today called Hispaniola. Uh, it was it was named La Española by Christopher Columbus, and um, that means the Spanish island. The Spanish island, Hispaniola, is the anglicized version of La Española. Okay, the um, uh, we know that the uh, Taino referred to that land as uh, Quisaquea. Uh, that's one of the names they refer to it as, Quisaquea. Now, the island on which the Dominican Republic and Haiti reside, okay, is uh, La Española or Hispaniola. He later sailed in San Juan, Puerto Rico, okay? Uh, Juan Garrido is the first documented Black person to arrive in this country and he is also the first black conquistador. So he would be the first person we know of by name to come to come to the U.S., to come to the land that we call the United States of America. 1513, this is before Jamestown, Virginia in 1607 even exists as a colony. Now, and like the other conquistadors, Juan Garrido soon succumbed to the lure of wealth and fame in the New World. He joined Diego uh, Velasquez de uh, Cuellar and the legendary Juan Ponce de Leon in the colonizations 
of uh, Cuba and P Puerto Rico, respectively. Then in 1513, uh, Juan, uh, Juan Garrido joined Juan Ponce de Leon's well-known expedition to Florida in search of the Fountain of Youth when he became the first known African uh, to arrive in this country or what would be what would become the United States of America. Read the rest of this article here. Uh, who was the first African-American? OK, now we know based upon the research by Dr. David M. Hotep and others. OK, we know that African people have been in the land that we call the United States of America. Going back at least fifty one thousand seven hundred years ago. And this was our land uh, stolen from us. OK, this was our land stolen from us. This is why we have to have a seismic shift in uh, our consciousness in a seismic shift in uh, the study of our history. OK, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the, the radius of a man's or woman's thoughts, you can control the comforts of their actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. So uh, Dr. David M. Hotel's book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence, his, uh, his first book uh, on this subject, which came out in 2011, page 14 of his book, um, he deals with um, evidence of an African presence that digs back at least 51,700 years ago in uh, that was found in Allendale County, South Carolina during the, and it, this was a discovery made in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. And you know, we've had uh, Dr. David M. Hotep on the African History Network show numerous times, probably about 13 times now. Um, on page 14 of his book, he talks about how they found um, 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting the African presence. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. They found um, linguistics, paintings, skull, skeleton structures and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence documenting an African presence in this country um going back at least 51,700 years ago his book is backed up by 713 footnotes as well as seven peer-reviewed articles now here's a, a picture of dr albert goodyear and this is a, a article from sciencedaily.com from uh november uh 2004 november 18 2004 the name of the article is New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. And uh, a synopsis, a summary of the article, and this is the summary coming from ScienceDaily.com. This is not my summary. This is what they say. And you can go read this article in its entirety at ScienceDaily.com. It says, radio tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Okay, so you could read that article, uh, New Evidence Puts Man in North America uh, 50,000 years ago. All right. So then we, we have to ask, well, who were these African people? So these were the Khoisan who have the oldest DNA on the planet. These are the short statured Africans. Uh, the Khoisan come from southern Africa. They go all around the world. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. And they were also here in this land that we call the United States of America. An October 2012 genetic study published in Science magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, Bushmen are genetically unique and no other currently known population 
had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. So here's a picture of a couple of Khoisan women. Okay. Uh, now, the Khoisan lived mainly in southern Africa in territories spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, uh, or gatherers known as the Sans people, and keepers of the livestock known as the Khoi Khoi people. The Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. Okay, so there's a good article from AtlantaBlackStar.com called Five Ethnic Groups that put the first human, uh, that proved the first humans were black. Five ethnic groups that proved the first humans were black. Okay, now, um, the Khoisan uh, language is a Bantu language, all right? And in, in the movie Black Panther, the, um, uh, the the language that we see spoken in the, in the movie Black Panther is Isikosa, which is a Bantu language also. OK, um, if we look at what is Bantu, uh, Bantu languages are a group of some 500 languages belonging to the Bantoid subgroup of the Benoit, uh, the Banu Congo branch of the Niger Congo language family. The Bantu languages are spoken in a very large area, including most of Africa, from southern Cameroon eastward to um, Kenya and southward to the southernmost tip of the continent 12 bantu languages are spoken by more than 5 million people including rundi rwanda shona kosa or isi kosa and uh zulu okay uh swahili which is spoken by 5 million people as a mother tongue and some uh 30 million as a second language is a Bantu lingua franca important in both uh, commerce and literature. So for more information, check out this article from Britannica.com called um, what is uh, that deals with Bantu and Bantu languages. All right. OK, now let's continue here. Um, Let's see. And also, you can, if you like this type of information, you can register for the uh, 12 week online course that I teach on Sundays, normally 2 p.m. Uh, to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution to the U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. So, we're going to start that class as soon as I finish with this broadcast today. Our next class is Saturday, March 26th. Uh, and we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch it anytime. Uh, we have the link here in the thread of the broadcast, but it's also on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. So when you go to the website and scroll down the page, uh, scroll down, we have the information there. Let's see. Okay. Yep. Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution. Okay. So, uh, so the class is on sale eighty dollars. Regular one hundred thirty dollars. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. Uh, click right here to register here for the course. As soon as you register, you can start watching content. You can watch the class we did last week, and you can join us in class today. And then the class I teach on Saturdays is. Um, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Okay. Uh, and we do a thousands of years of history, what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade happening. Click right here to register for the full course also. And we had a great class uh, yesterday. So as soon as you register, you can watch the class that we did uh, uh, on Saturday, March uh, 25th. Okay. And I'm going to post the link here uh, so you can register for today's uh, class, and then you can uh, also watch the archive content, and you'll be able to join us in class as well on April 2nd, okay, April 2nd, uh, and April 9th, and April 16th, okay, so you'll be registered for all of the uh, upcoming classes also. Uh, let me post the, okay, and 
here's another link for the course as well all right let's continue give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like on this broadcast hopefully everybody can hear me okay all right can everybody hear me well testing testing okay you should be able to hear me okay because i had to upgrade the laptop and buy this new laptop so uh everything should be good which was a huge investment all right so let's go back to this article here uh dealing with uh myths about slavery that we need to stop believing and this is a good article from the washington post by dr dana ramey berry and uh dr talitha lafloria we've had both both of these uh african-american female historians on the african history network show all right let's continue here so uh so they talked about isabel uh de de overa overa a, a free woman of african descent who in the 1600 went on the expedition to new spain uh these stories too are important to u.s history they place the starting point of african-american history and freedom as well as enslavement now the second myth about slavery we need to stop believing i hear and i love malcolm you see a picture of malcolm x behind me and i hear people quote this oftentimes and it's a very uh it's an over simplistic way of looking at this history but the second myth we need to stop believing is that uh enslaved uh people who worked in the house had easier lives enslaved people who worked in the house had easier lives so in a 1963 speech, Malcolm X strongly separated enslaved people who worked in the house from those who worked in the fields, claiming that the former group, the, the uh, house slaves, enjoyed greater privileges and comforts and that some even identified with their enslavers. Now, texts designed to teach children about slavery often assert that people forced into domestic labor had more comfortable and pleasant lives than those forced into agricultural labor but the distinction is not that simple they're absolutely correct the distinction is not that simple when you actually study the history while a few of the very largest plantations had entirely separate labor pools says historian greg uh, down in most households laborers move between tasks depending on their age or the season depending on their age or the season, spring, winter, summer, fall, okay? Um, and working indoors had its own physical and psychological hardships. Enslaved African people were on call 24 hours a day, mostly on their feet and in close proximity to their enslavers, which, would, which led to uh, greater scrutiny of their work, according to historian Deborah Gray, Deborah Gray White. Some of this labor included helping their enslaver dress, bathe, style their hair, and fan flies, in addition to cooking, cleaning, and running errands. Intimate interactions involving personal touch and knowledge of people's innermost lives. In these settings, uh, writes historian uh, the, uh, the Valia Glymph, G-L-Y-M-P-H, domestic laborers often experience physical and sexual abuse. Okay, uh, now the next myth about slavery that we need to stop believing is slavery was limited to the South. Sla slavery was limited to the South. Now, if we go back to number two very quickly here so also it's important to understand that in many in a lot a lot of times in rebellions that took place um you had uh africans in the house who were working with uh other africans involved in rebellions and feeding information but also we see this when it comes to the u.s civil war and in the south you had uh africans who worked in the house who were spies for the union feeding information to the secretly feeding information to union soldiers about the maneuvers of the confederate soldiers because they 
you know, the Confederate soldiers and, and those in the military and the generals and things like this, they're uh, having meetings and their servants are African people. OK, so you have that dynamic that's taking place as well. So it's there's a there's an oversimplification there uh, uh, that Malcolm is talking about, even though we love Malcolm. This is, is a much more complicated, more nuanced narrative when you study the history. Number three, slavery was limited to the South. Slavery was limited to the South. And this is something that a lot of people like to talk about especially when it comes to dealing with repairing the damage of a legacy of slavery. And you have people who say, oh, well, that was just in the South. They didn't have uh, slavery was abolished in the North. But the North was still involved in slavery to varying degrees, even after slavery was abolished in the North. Now, when people think about slavery in the United States, they often picture large cotton plantations in the Deep South. One popular textbook claims that while cotton enriched uh, planters in the South, as well as bankers and ship owners in the North, the latter, the North, still relied on a free labor system. The latter, the North, still relied on a free labor system. Similarly, the uh, College Board's curriculum for advanced placement U.S. history Advanced Placement U.S. History states that, uh, quote, the North's expanding manufacturing economy relied on free labor in contrast to the Southern economy's dependence on slave labor, end quote. But these accounts, which simplistically oppose free Northern states with slave southern states neglect to mention the long-standing presence of enslaved labor in the north slavery touched nearly every corner of this country northern communities uh supported and benefited from southern slavery through the shipbuilding textile and shoemaking industries through the shipbuilding textiles and shoemaking industry in Rhode Island alone, slave traders shipped more than 100,000 African captives to the Caribbean and American colonies, according to People Not Property, which is an online documentary. OK, so in Rhode Island, you, you have them shipping Africans into the Caribbean as well. All right. Not just dealing with slavery here in this country or in the 13 colonies, which will become the United States. In Rhode Island alone, slave traders shipped more than 100,000 African captives to the Caribbean and American colonies. Plantations along the Connecticut, Delaware and Hudson Rivers relied on enslaved workers to produce wheat and process it into flour. Slavery was widespread at universities. The Maryland Jesuits who founded and ran Georgetown uh, University so uh, enslaved laborers to pay off debts to keep the school in operation. And early presidents of Harvard University uh, brought enslaved labor to work on campus. Enslaved laborers built the uh, structure in lower Manhattan for which Wall Street is named, okay? Now, if we look at this article, uh, this other article here that I want to reference, we look at this uh, article, the hidden links between uh, slavery and Wall Street, the hidden links between slavery and Wall Street. Because once again, you have an oversimplification of this history and people try to act like oh slavery was just in um slavery was just in the north okay which is not which uh at one time all of the uh 13 colonies had slavery it is true that the northern colonies abolished slavery first okay um and you're gonna have 
Massachusetts around 1780. You're going to have Vermont uh, around 1777, abolished slavery, somewhere, uh, somewhere around there. Um, they, so that is true, but they're still going to have ties to slavery. So if we look at this article, uh, the hidden links between slavery and Wall Street. The hidden links between slavery and Wall Street. This is from uh, the BBC, bbc.com, uh, August 29, 2019. Okay. Uh, if we look here at. Right here, by some estimates, New York received 40% of U.S. cotton revenue through money, its financial firms, through money, its financial firms, shipping businesses, and insurance companies earned. Okay, this is the city of New York. By some estimates, New York received 40% of U.S. cotton revenue through money its financial firms, shipping businesses, and insurance companies earned. But scholars differ on just how direct a line can be drawn between slavery and modern economic practices in the U.S. Now, Gavin Wright, who's a professor emeritus of economic history at Stanford University, said, quote, People in non-slave areas, people in non-slave areas, Britain and free U.S. states like northern states routinely did business with slave owners and slave commerce. Now, he went on. To, now, but, but he says the uniqueness of slavery's economic contribution has been exaggerated by some. Now, slavery thrived under colonial rule. And you have British, British and Dutch settlers relied on enslaved African people to help establish farms and build the new towns and cities that would eventually become the United States, that would eventually become the United States. Enslaved African people were brought to work on the cotton, sugar and tobacco plantations. The groups they grew, the, the crops they grew were sent to Europe or to the northern colonies, okay, or to the northern colonies to be turned into finished products. So even after the North abolishes slavery, they're still profiting off of slavery when it comes to shipbuilding, when it comes to uh, deposits made into northern banks uh, from slaveholders in the South, when it, when it comes to the uh, products that the textile mills are producing and the cotton products that textile mills are producing. Uh, the uh, And then you have um, Wall Street and the uh, crops that are being sold on Wall Street, et, et cetera, the, the various stocks, and cotton, things of this nature. Insurance companies, even insurance companies in the North were taking out insurance policies on uh, enslaved Africans, uh, on plantations in the south but also on slave ships as well okay so you have uh the north still profiting off of the south even after the north abolishes slavery now those finished goods were used to fund trips to africa to obtain more africans to enslave them who would then traffic back to america this triangular trade this triangular trading route was profitable for investors to raise the money to start many future plantation owners to raise the, to raise the money to start many future plantation owners uh, turned to capital markets in London selling debt that was used to purchase boats, goods, and eventually purchase African people. Now, later in the 19th century, U.S. banks and southern states would sell securities that helped fund the expansion of slave-run plantations. 
to balance the risk that came with forcibly bringing humans from Africa to America, insurance policies were purchased. Insurance policies were purchased. These policies protected against the risk of a boat sinking and the risks of losing individual uh, slaves once they made it to America. Some of the largest insurance farms in the U.S., like the New York Life Insurance Company, which started out as the Nautilus Mutual Life Insurance Company in uh, the spring of 1845. OK, then they're going to change their name to the New York Life Insurance Company. Uh, but some uh, firms like the um, New York Life Insurance Company, AIG, uh, Aetna, all sold policies that insured slave owners would be compensated if the African slaves they owned were injured or killed. Now, by the mid 19th century, exports of raw cotton accounted for more than half of U.S. overseas shipments. By the mid 19th century, as exports of raw cotton accounted for more than half of U.S. overseas shipments or what we would call exports. What wasn't sold abroad was sent to uh, mills these factories in the north, in the northern states, including Massachusetts and Rhode Island, to be turned into fabric. So here you have, once again, the northern states benefiting from slavery in the southern states and the products and the cotton that the southern states are producing. The the money southern plantation owners earned cannot be kept under mattresses or behind loose floorboards. American banks accepted their deposits and counted enslaved people as assets when assessing a person's wealth. OK, like Thomas Jefferson, for instance, in recent years, U.S. banks have made public apologies for the role that they played in slavery. In 2005, J.P. Morgan Chase, currently the biggest bank in the U.S., admitted that two of its subsidiary banks, uh, Citizens Bank and Canal Bank in Louisiana, accepted enslaved people as collateral for loans. If plantation owners defaulted on loan payment, the banks took ownership of these African slaves. Now, J.P. Morgan uh, was not alone. J.P. Morgan Chase was not alone. The predecessors that made up Citibank, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo are among a list of well-known U.S. financial firms that benefited from the slave trade. Uh, Sven Beckert, uh, Laird Bell, professor of American history at Harvard University, said slavery was an overwhelmingly important fact of the American economy. Slavery was an overwhelmingly important fact of the American economy. Now, Professor Becker points out that while cities like Boston never played a large role in the slave trade, they benefited from the connections to slave driven economies. They benefited from the connection to slave driven economies. New England merchants made money selling timber and ice to the South and the Caribbean. In turn, Northern merchants bought raw cotton and sugar. So you see all of the 13 colonies and you're gonna see many of the Northern states, if not all of them, involved in slavery some way or another even after the northern states abolished slavery now new england's fabric mills played a key role in the u.s industrial revolution but their supply of cotton came from the slave reliant south so we know the industrial revolution starts in the 1790s in uh manchester england okay and there's a good article from also from uh, BBC 
uh, .co.uk called Slave Trade in the British Economy, Slave Trade in the British Economy uh, that you can check out. OK, and I'll pull up this article here um, as well. How's everybody doing today? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Uh, this one right here. And I'll give you information about the online class that I'm teaching today as well. Uh, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movements. A 12-week 12, 12 online course that we teach on uh, Sundays, normally 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm running behind schedule today, so we're going to start it uh, as soon as I finish this broadcast here. We'll be here for a few more minutes. So uh, next class is Sunday, March 26, 2023. Okay, this one, um, you can read this article here. This is from the BBC. This is Slave Trade and the British Economy. Slave Trade and the British Economy. Uh, British profits were made from exporting uh, manufactured goods to Africa and importing products of enslaved labor such as sugar, uh, ports such as Glasgow, Bristol and Liverpool, England, Liverpool, England prospered as a result of the slave trade. OK, so they talk about manufacturing, but it's going to be in Manchester, England, the Manchester, England area. That's going to be where the uh, Industrial Revolution begins in the in the 1790s. And then you have the creation of the cotton gin in uh, right about 1793 by Eli Whitney. You're going to have the cotton gin and creation and, and copies of the cotton gin that are going to drastically, re, uh, drastically reduce the cost of producing cotton, make it very, make it much easier to produce cotton. And it, it was a, a device that picked the seeds uh, from uh, cotton. So this is going to then increase the need for enslaved African labor as well. From 1750 onwards, a new industry emerged in Britain, uh, the production of cotton cloth, the production of cotton cloth. Wool production had previously been Britain's major industry, but cotton had one key advantage. Machinery could produce cotton fibers better, better than wool. As a result, it was cotton production that the Industrial Revolution began. As a result, it was in cotton production that the industrial revolution began particularly in and around manchester england the cotton used was mostly imported from slave plantations slavery provided the raw material for industrial change and growth the growth of the atlantic economy was an integral part of the growth of exports for example manufactured cotton cloth was exported to africa the Atlantic economy can be seen as the spark for the biggest change in modern economic history. The Atlantic economy in the 1700s was founded on slave labor. OK, so read the rest of this article and they have different panels in the article. This is from panel number four. OK, uh, slave trade and the British economy. This is from uh, BBC, bbc.co.uk. All right, let's continue here. And if you like this type of information, also, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We're celebrating our 13th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show first started March 10th, 2010. Um, so we've been going 13 years. We have the information also on the homepage of our website, the African History Network dot com. And we'll be on live tonight, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on uh, 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. And we'll be on our social media platforms uh, broadcasting live. Also, the African History Network show. We're um, normally on live Sundays, 9 p.m. To, to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as well. OK. All right. Let's continue here. So this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, et cetera. 
All right, let's go back to this article dealing with myths about slavery. We need to stop believing. Uh, so the third myth was uh, slavery was limited to the South. Slavery was limited to the South. So we just talked about that. And we know at one point, all the 13 colonies had slavery. And even after they abolished it, the, even after the northern colonies abolished it, they were still connected to it in various ways. Okay, number four. Women were not as involved in slave owning as men were. Women were not as involved in slave owning as men were. Okay, now, uh, the 1939 blockbuster movie Gone with the Wind uh, cemented, cemented the myth of the essentially innocent Southern Belle who only passively benefited from slavery, who only passively benefited from slavery. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, historians who studied female slaveholders uh, tended to portray them as ambivalent about a role inherit, inherited from their fathers or husbands making the best of a situation over which they had no control. In fact, white women actively participated in the, in the institution of slavery. In the book, They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South by historian uh, Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers, who's a, um, uh, she's a, a professor at uh, UCLA uh, in California, if I remember correctly, it's UCLA. Uh, Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers shows that white women had a deep economic investment in slavery and exercised extraordinary control over the enslaved people in their households. Many white women learned this practice from birth, receiving enslaved African people as gifts when they were children or even infants. Women bought and sold uh, people, white women bought and sold people at, at auctions and successfully sued their male family members for control of their laborers. White women supervised plantations and brutally punished their human property. One white mistress crushed the jaw of an eight-year-old Henrietta King under the uh, weight of a rocking chair because Henrietta King had taken a piece of candy. The woman who enslaved Harriet Jacobs spit in the kettles and pans to keep her from eating leftover scraps. Now, I don't know if Henrietta Jacobs spit in uh, her white female slave owners water like Kizzy did in uh, Roots. You remember, <laughs> I don't know if she did that, but you know, hey. <laughs> All right, now I did a, a presentation dealing with uh, Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers and her book. They were her property, it, it, her groundbreaking book. And her book uh, deals with how about 40% of slave owners from uh, 1850 to 1860 uh, were white women, okay? now. Now, AtlantaBlackStar.com has a good article uh, about this book. And the name of the, name of the article is uh, Research by Female Professor. And let's, uh, let's flip over to this article here because I have it up. Okay, Research by Professor, by, Research by Black Female Professor reveals startling, startling truth that white women made up 40% of slave owners. This is from March 25th, 2019 from AtlantaBlackStar.com. Here's a picture of Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers, okay? And it says, um, uh, Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers, an associate professor of history uh, at the university. She's at uh, Univ University of California, Berkeley. That's where she is, yeah. Uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley, an associate professor uh, uh, co uh, combed through data from the 1850 and 1860 
uh, U.S. Census and revealed that white women made up around 40 percent of slave owners. White women made up around 40 percent of slave owners. The findings helped Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers compile her book. They were her property, white women and slave owners in the American South. Now, on her department page, uh, the history department page at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers describes the February 2019 release as, quote, a regional study that draws upon uh, formerly enslaved people's testimony to dramatically reshape current understandings of white women's economic relationships to slavery, end quote. OK, uh, in the book, uh, Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers explained that white women's involvement in slavery comes from family uh, as their slave owning parents, quote, typically gave their daughters more enslaved people than land, typically gave their daughters more enslaved people than land. Quote, what this means is that their very identities as Southern white women are tied to the actual or the possible ownership of other people, she said, according to history.com, which is the official website of the History Channel, because the, because the History Channel quotes her. Her book also notes that owning enslaved Africans served as white women's primary source of wealth. Owning enslaved Africans served as white women's primary source of wealth plus owning a large number of enslaved people reportedly made them made uh, women better marriage material okay uh, once wed white women were said to have fought and frequently won the right to continue to have ownership over enslaved africans not handing over ownership to their husbands OK, so uh, read the rest of this. She went on to say for, for them, slavery was their freedom. OK, now, of course, we're not saying all white women own slaves. We're not saying that at all. Yes, there were white women who were abolitionists also, but white women played a larger were involved in slavery and owning African people to a much larger degree than originally had been told in history over the past few decades so read this article also uh history the history channel has a piece on this as well and this deals with um a women as slave owners uh what's that was what's the name of this one? Oh, it's called the massive overlooked role yeah, this one right here, the massive overlooked role of female slave owners, the massive overlooked role of female slave owners. This is from history.com, the official website of the History Channel. You can check out this article as well. And um, they um, quote Professor Stephanie E. Jones Rogers here in this article also from the History Channel. The massive overlooked role of female slave owners. It's estimated that 40 percent of slave owners may have been white women well then uh, they were white women okay and they, they talk about professor professor stephanie e jones rogers here all right so read that one so these myths are being put to rest okay hopefully the evidence is there okay to put these myths to rest all right how's everybody doing today give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like uh follow us here on the african history network uh, facebook fan page Turn on live notifications when we go live. Follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Um, also register for the online history courses that I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. We have another class that I'm teaching today uh, as soon as I finish this broadcast. Uh, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement. It's a 12-week online course uh, that I teach. And we look at history from 1800 through 1968 teaches at my online school, the African History Network. So you can register for uh, this 12 week online course. We do the sessions live, all the sessions are archived and recorded. I uh, normally do 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sundays. I'm running behind schedule today. the day. I had to teach a class. I uh, had to teach a class yesterday and um, I'm getting ready to do our radio show tonight, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we're going to get started here in a few minutes. 
But uh, click right here to uh, register here for the full class. It's on sale $80, regularly $130. And we have a bundle pack where you get both classes for um, $120 also. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. And you can go back and watch it anytime. Okay, so a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. And we look at history uh, chronologically from 1800 uh, to uh, 1968. And we start with the uh, census of 1800, the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1803, and the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, because those two events were uh, are related. And we go through and look at history chronologically to see what leads up to the Civil War taking place. We look, we uh, analyze the Civil War. We look at the Reconstruction Era, 1865, 1877, Jim Crow Era, Great Migration, 1915, 1970, World War I, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement to understand what happened to us after slavery ended. What were the laws and policies put in place to bring us to where we are today to understand where we need to go from here? Okay, so you can register for that at theafricanhistorynetwork.com. And we have uh, the link on the thread of our broadcast also uh, to register for the class. Okay, number uh, five, number five myth about slavery. We need to stop believing the Civil War ended slavery. The Civil War ended slavery. Okay. Uh, many uh, Americans have internalized the idea that slavery ended shortly after the Civil War. A National Geographic Educational Guide, for example, marks December 18th as, as the day the United States abolished uh, slavery by adopting the 13th Amendment. Senator uh, uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell recently uh, arguing against reparations called slavery something that happened 150 years ago. But we're still dealing with the legacy of slavery. OK. Um, and Georgia child slavery did end December 6th. 1865 when georgia ratified the 13th amendment and then it's going to be adopted december 18th 1865 it is true we're still dealing with a legacy of slavery decades of jim crow segregation redlining things like this um some people look at uh the convict leasing system and say that's a continuation of slavery uh the convict there were uh, uh, a lot less people in the convict leasing system than who were enslaved who were enslaved the convict leasing system was short-lived however and uh the last state to abolish it it basically starts in alabama in like the 1840s or so alabama abolishes it in 1928 okay um but the sharecropping system did a lot more damage than the convict leasing system did okay now they talk about the practice in which private enterprises lease felony prisoners uh, from the state for a fee, primarily targeted black men, women, and youth. African Americans were incarcerated for trivial offenses such as loitering, stealing farm animals, breaking into railroad cars, cars, spitting on the sidewalk, and vagrancy. Uh, some were uh, individually auctioned at county courthouses, while others were rented in groups. Comic leasing involved holding people against their will, separating them from their families, working them from sun up to sundown, beating, whipping. That that is that that is true. Um, it it but keep in mind, it was in chattel slavery. That was something that you were born into as well. Okay, so but the comic leasing system did happen. Um, is legally abolished in 1928. Now, most of the other states had gotten rid of it prior to 1928. Alabama was the was the, the sole holdout on it. Though the convict leasing system was legally abolished in 1928, at least 37 states still permit contracting prison labor out of private companies. Um, okay. So read the rest of this uh, here and, and also understand People talk about privatized prisons. Yes, privatized prisons should be abolished, but only 8% of prisons in the U.S. are privatized prisons. Most, the overwhelming majority of prisons in the U.S. are not privatized prisons. Even though privatized prisons should be abolished, only about 8% of the prisons in the U.S. are privatized prisons. Okay, so check out this article from uh, the Washington Post. Look at the other articles that I talked about as well. Uh, five myths about slavery. Okay, five myths about slavery. 
uh, February 7th, 2020. Uh, check out the other articles I've talked about. Now, this uh, there's one article I forgot to mention. I meant to mention it when we dealt with, um, that we talked about the British and the Dutch and Wall Street, right? So where does the name Wall Street come from? Where does the name Wall Street come from? Now, there's a good article from uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com called Seven Eye-Opening Facts on How Wall Street Was Built and Created Via Slavery. Seven Eye-Opening Facts on How Wall Street Was Built and Created Via Slavery. Now, this is from December 30th, 2014, December 30th, 2014 for AtlantaBlackStar.com. And uh, the first fact, enslaved Africans actually built the wall that gave Wall Street its name, okay? New York City was a Dutch settlement known as New Amsterdam, known as New Amsterdam in the Dutch colonial province called New Netherland during much of the 17th century. Through the Dutch West India Company, the Dutch West India, India Company, the Dutch utilized the labor of enslaved Africans who were first brought to the colony around 1627. Now, the enslaved Africans built the wall that gives Wall Street its name, forming the northern boundary of the colony that warded off uh, resisting natives who, uh, in 1627, yeah, warding off, uh, the, the enslaved Africans built the wall that gives Wall Street its name, forming the northern boundary of the colony that warded off resisting natives who wanted their land back. So from its creation, the wall that Wall Street is named after was a hedge ensuring the survival of whites and white supremacy. Okay, so that goes back to 1627 in the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam. And it was a wall built by African people. So read the rest of this article here. Seven eye-opening facts on how Wall Street was built and created via slavery. All right. So hopefully you learned a lot today. Uh, you support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App and uh, through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Register for our class that we're doing today, uh, Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement and Black Power Movement. It's a 12 week online course uh, that I teach on Sundays. And um, soon as, uh, so we're about to teach the class now at our online school I'm about to wrap up this broadcast listen to the african history network show uh sundays 9 p.m to 11 p.m eastern standard time on uh 9 10 a.m superstation wfdf and on our social media platforms visit our website the african history network.com the african history network.com uh for more information remember right now is correct wrong behavior is not over till we win what kind of